Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Molly Blau-Gillis and I'm Chief Communications Officer at General Catalyst. We're so glad you're here for our third session of our Conversation Catalyst speaker series. GC created the Conversation Catalyst to feature unique perspectives, insight and leadership from GC, our portfolio, our community and beyond, focused on topics that are core to our mission of investing in powerful positive change that endures including responsible innovation, health assurance, and economic access, to name a few. In today's conversation, GC's Head of Responsible Innovation, Raghavan Srinivasan, will lead a discussion with internet pioneers and innovators, Bob Kahn and Vint Cerf, sharing their unique experience and perspective on innovating with intention and avoiding unintended consequences. Our Conversation Catalyst series will continue in May with a panel discussion led by our very own chairman and managing director, Ken Chenault, entitled, How Do We Ensure No One Is Left Behind? The Business Case for Creating Economic Access, Opportunity, and Equity. More information and registration for this upcoming session, as well as other news and updates, can be found on our social media channels. A few housekeeping items. As a reminder, this session is being recorded. Closed captioning as well as a live transcript are available for those who are interested. If anything should happen with the Zoom session, please immediately log back into the meeting and we will proceed. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce my partner, Raghavan Srinivasan. Raghavan joined GC in January to guide GC's responsible innovation practice, embracing the promise of digital transformation with fewer unintended consequences broader participation and lasting benefit to people everywhere. Responsible innovation is the driving theme behind General Catalyst's mission, investing in powerful positive change that endures. Prior to joining GC, Raghavan was head of product at Facebook AI, building state-of-the-art AI and machine learning technologies, platforms, and experiences for all of Facebook, from research to production. Previously, he led product management at Mozilla Corporation. Raghavan, thank you for leading our discussion today. I'm thrilled to hand it off to you to formally introduce our esteemed guests. Thanks for the introduction, Molly. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining today's discussion. We are here to talk about innovating with intention and avoiding unintended consequences. This is key to my work and GC's commitment to responsible innovation, which is a framework for thinking about how we build the next generation of market leading companies that are engineered from the outset for exceptional financial and societal returns. And today we're gonna to hear from two absolute legends of internet history, Bob Kahn and Vince Cerf, co-designers and architects of the TCP IP protocols and the architecture of the internet on their journey to build an enduring technology and an enduring relationship with innovation and intentionality. Vint Cerf is Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist at Google. He has served in executive positions at ICANN, the Internet Society, MCI, the Corporation for National Research Initiatives, and DARPA. A former Stanford professor and former member of the US National Science Board, he is also the past president of the ACM and serves in advisory capacities at NIST, DOE, NSF, and NASA. Bob Kahn is president and CEO of the Corporation for National Research Initiatives, a nonprofit organization he founded in 1986. In 1966, he took a leave of absence from MIT to join BBN, where he was responsible for the system design of ARPANET, the pioneering packet switch computer network. In 1972, as director of DARPA's Information Processing Techniques Office, he initiated the Strategic Computing Program, the largest computer research and development program ever undertaken by the federal government to that point. More recently, he has been involved in the development and deployment of the digital object architecture, an open architecture for managing information on the internet. Bob and Vint have been awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor in the US, the Turing Award, the highest distinction in computer science, the Legion d'Honneur, the highest order of merit in France, 
the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering, the US National Medal of Technology and Innovation, and dozens of honorary doctoral degrees. Bob Kahn and Vince Cerf, we are honored to have you join us to share your founder's journey, your insights on the responsibility of today's technology and your visions for the future. Thank you for being here today. Well, good morning, Raghavan. It's a real pleasure to join you today. We're looking forward to the, dis the, uh, the discussion. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks for those lovely introductory, introductory words. Thank you. Awesome. Um, so we have a fun-filled conversation set up for today, um, and we're going to be talking about a few different aspects of, uh, of responsible innovation, also you know, your work here. And I figured it would be really appropriate for us to start at the beginning, so to speak, your founder journey. You know, as GC, we work a lot with entrepreneurs and founders, you know, across the world. And as one of the original founders of the internet, I would love to hear about your story for how you got started, how you met each other, and more importantly, how you built this enduring product and enduring relationship. The two of you have been collaborating and have been close friends for 50 years, maybe even more. So I would love to maybe kick this conversation off with that story. I think you should start, Bob, because the, uh, we met uh, during the ARPANET pro period when you had uh, architectural responsibility for a lot of that. But it was your idea that we should build separate networks around the same tech, around distinct technologies and optimize around them that really triggered the internet architecture. And so it's interesting to know what it, what was it that caused you to move from the, let's just build one big network and use every possible communication technology in it to uh, a, a more disaggregated uh, architecture? Well, <clears throat> I, I think the, the most important thing to realize is that Vint and I both started out as, as scientists really and engineers of one sort or another. Vint came from a computer science background. I was more from a communications and electrical engineering background. And these were just interesting times. I, the, the idea that you could build a network to link computers was just really interesting. And so it was the science and the engineering of it that was the motivation. We were not thinking in megalomaniac terms of you know, creating something for the whole world. It, it was just not on our radar screen. The question was more likely, how would you build such a net? Maybe what would you do with it? I mean, it was really very, very much exploratory at the time. Um, and, you know, it wasn't a given by any means that this was a good idea to most people. Uh, I mean, the university communities were mainly involved with a lot of batch processing. They didn't want to open up their machines to other people to come in and make use of their limited facilities. Um, I got <clears throat> more questions from people early on. Why was I throwing my career away? There was no future in networking. Nobody wanted it. Besides which, if it were going to happen, it was going to be the big companies. Uh, back in that day, probably AT&T was going to do it, if anybody. So what the heck were we doing? Well, the bottom line is we were pursuing science and technology. That's really what it was. I actually met them for the first time when he was still a grad student at UCLA, as I recall. And right. his name had been given to me by a friend of his named uh, Steve Crocker, who said, is this guy has been a longtime friend of mine, you really should meet him. And so on one of my trips out there, I made up an appointment and went to see Ben. We had a great conversation and it was really, as you said, the start of a 50 year collaboration. Now, at times it was very tight, you know, we'd see each other regularly. When he was at DARPA um, and I was a director of DARPA, we saw each other probably every day when one of us was not on travel. In more recent years, Vince has sort of gone on his own. He wanted to put his own stamp on things, uh, but we've stayed in touch um, on a fairly regular basis. And I think it's one of the collaborations, not, not the only one, because I've had a very good collaboration with my wife, who's a copyright lawyer, uh, on some of the more interesting intellectual property aspects of managing information. But the, the, the interaction with Vint has, has sort of been one of the highlights of my life. 
But it still doesn't quite get to the question that I was hoping to answer, which is that when, when we worked on the ARPANET, which is a single network with a number of other colleagues, and we managed to get the computers to talk to each other through this packet switch network. And by the way, packet switching at the time was not an obvious uh, you know, uh, win. A lot of people said, well, it won't work. You know, the way you do this is the way the phone works. You know, uh, they could dial up the circuit, nail up the circuit, have the conversation between the computers and then hang up. But it didn't, didn't run fast enough. So we built and successfully ran this ARPANET thing. But Bob, you showed up in my office at Stanford in the spring of 73 with a very different view, which is that instead of incorporating these communication technologies into one single network, uh, essentially run by BBMN, that you had the idea that we should actually have different networks optimized for satellite or radio, mobile radio communication or the wireline ARPANET, and then hook them together somehow. But what was it that led you to that conclusion? Because if you had not come to that conclusion, we wouldn't have the internet that exists today. Well, uh, architecturally, it seemed to make sense to me. Um, I mean, I cut my teeth uh, in the part of, of AT&T AT Bell Labs that was responsible for the whole architecture of the Bell system. So I was very steeped with architectural notions on a grand scale, right, right from the, from the get-go. Um, well, let me comment on, on a variety of things you said. That one is that uh, there were articles that were published back in, in the 60s and early 70s, basically panning packet switching is not obeying good data principles whatever those were. Um, you know, a lot of people wanted to, you know, construct networks that were very tight and how were you going to manage the data? The idea that, you know, maybe the packet would get there and you didn't know quite how it would be routed, but hopefully it would get there quickly and might come out of order and maybe you put it back. It didn't seem to a lot of classical architects of communications that that was a good idea. Furthermore, um, when I got to DARPA, we, we had really one network that the community was making use of, and that was the ARPANET. And uh, as Vint mentioned, I was, uh, you know, as maybe I mentioned too, I'm very principally involved in that. But at DARPA, I got uh, to trying to make it happen two other networks. One was a, um, a packet radio net, it was a ground network, which I think is really the, you know, the forerunner of all of the today, today's CDMA type networks. Um, it used direct sequence red spectrum, it had embedded microcomputers. So we had one, one network like that, that we built. Um, and then there was, you know, the radios were big. I mean, they're like 70 pounds and the like, size of a bread box, you wouldn't put them in your shirt pocket. But um, the other network was intended to talk with our colleagues, research colleagues in Europe um, there had been point-to-point um, -point connections from the U.S. into various places in Europe, but to string them out um, was becoming increasingly difficult because of the CCITT rules, and which meant that everybody had to agree with everybody else. It had to be almost like a unanimous decision to put one more line in, and it became increasingly difficult to do that. You can spend time on that if you like, but um, so we built a um, a network using packet switching technology. It was kind of like an ethernet in the sky using Intel SAT4. Um, and the way it works is you broadcast a packet up and it would be pulled down by the appropriate ground station and passed along. The others would just, uh, you know, drop it. The problem was the way it was implemented at the time um, by BBNN in the packet switch, they took an ARPANET node, added more memory and made the transfer from the ARPANET to the satellite portion by an in-core memory transfer. And when I took a look at that, I said, you know, there's no way to manage this as a satellite net. And I was looking, as I was imagining the future was going to be lots of different nets since we already, uh, you can imagine local area nets, they didn't really show up until the ethernet came out big time what would you guess in 1974 or five at that time frame? Well, it was first demonstrated in May of 1973, which is when you and I started talking about multiple networks. In fact, just to, to try to accelerate the, to get to some of Raghavan's other questions, 
I would say that <clears throat> while you were at ARPA and we were trying to make this relevant to the Defense Department, command and control would require mobile vehicles and ships at sea. And the ARPA net wasn't designed for that. And so the mobile packet radio net deals with the mobile vehicles and the ships at sea get to use the shared packet satellite system. And that means you have three different networks at least, plus the ethernet, which is, as Bob says, just sort of nascent at that point. Um, and, and so the question was, how do you hook all these things together? That was the internet problem. Right. So it was important to me to split out the satellite net from the rest of the ARPANET. They were all bundled in one big software package. And it was uh, an interesting set of discussions with the folks at BBNN because it was essentially taking their responsibility. I mean, they had all the technical arguments on their side. You know, it was three boxes instead of two. We were talking about putting a, a, a box in the middle, which we were calling a gateway at the time. Today, you'd call it a router. Um, so you go from ARPANET to a router to a satellite net, and that would allow you to manage the routing of information through the system. and essentially allow each network to develop independently of the others. If you built any of that stuff into the individual nets, all the networks would have to change instantly. And that was kind of a non-starter. So I, I, could, I could see that as a, you know, a way to move forward in, in the future. I think Vint could too, just as easily as I could. And it took a while to make it all happen. It wasn't clear, uh, frankly, within the DOD, that this was a DOD problem. So, so that's a really fascinating um, point, Bob. And, and maybe, you know, this is a good time for me to also ask you another angle of this, because designing something like this, you know, I was, I was chatting with Vint um, earlier, you know, last week, and he said, oh, yeah, we kind of like, you know, designed the internet and we kind of got it done in about six months, right? And I was like, it was just mind blowing that, you know, something so profound happened that quickly. So I'd love to maybe hear from you what were sort of the design principles and intentional choices? that you made, you know, there's so much that's spoken about the decentralization um, that was so core to the architecture, the open collaboration that you had. Did you even think about business models? Like how did you go about thinking about what was really important? What were the principles and what guided you in designing, you know, what is basically the internet today? I, mean, I don't think it was that way at all. I mean, we were not, I was not trying to engineer the network for the universe of the future, it was more, let's see if we can figure out how to make it work. Let's get a small community. We'll get a bunch of researchers together and try and make it happen. Now, incrementally, I think it grew on us that this could be real. Um, I remember seeing for the first time on one of the TV shows, if you want to communicate with us, we have a new way to do it. Send email to such and such at uh, Nightly News or something. I think, oh my God, it's, you know, it's taken over for real. You know, maybe Vint had a different model, but, uh, you know, I think most people at that time would have argued that if you were going to make something like this happen, it was probably just going to happen in, in the U.S. and maybe a few European partners. Uh, it was probably going to involve, uh, you know, AT&T, the, the carriers didn't show up in mobile forms until sometime later in the 80s. Um, and, uh, you know, eventually it just became so important. I mean, I remember being invited to a discussion at Belcor in the late 1980s, where they were for the first time concerned that this internet thing wasn't going away. They thought it would just disappear at some point in time. And some technology they had developed, I think it was ATM and Sonnet, if you know what those are. Uh, would, would somehow take over the world because that's what they would be pushing, but it didn't happen. And so they had this sort of two circles on the board, ATM versus internet, and they wanted to see the internet go away. I said, you know, not going to happen. So we just, had a whole, I'm sorry, go ahead, Lynn. Well, I, would, I just wanted to, uh, to respond to uh, Raghavan's question a slightly different way. Uh, at the time that when you showed up and said multiple networks, uh, I, uh, uh, grab that because my immediate thought was, okay, we're thinking about command and control. We know we've got to deal with mobile vehicles, ships at sea. We know we have these different kinds of network technologies. They're all packet switch. We're going to have to deal with our allies. They're going to have to, if we're going to use this, it's going to have to work for them too. 
the idea of having separate networks that could be interconnected but operated independently was extremely attractive because pretty sure that you know yeah. uh, the UK was not going to ask the US to run their command and control system. So the idea of being able to run networks independently and still make them enter work was uh, almost essential. Uh, as for business models, we weren't thinking about business models. And in fact, in the end, uh, we ignored business models and said, I don't care what the business model is, Take whichever one works for you, as long as all the costs get paid for. So uh, we wanted as much in independence for the network as, as we could get, mm -hmm. while at the same time establishing commonality so that every host on every network could talk to any other host on any other network. Everything should be able to interact with everything else unless they didn't want to. But the idea was to make sure everything could uh, communicate with everything else. We couldn't know what the applications were going to be necessarily, except for the few that we had on the ARPANET, electronic mail, file transfer, and remote access to timeshare machines. But there, I want to emphasize that the uh, openness of the architecture and, and the unconstrained nature of the architecture meant that, even if we didn't understand it at the time, meant that there was just this enormously open field of possibilities. New protocols could be added at the different layers in the architecture. New layers could be added, which is what happened when Tim Berners-Lee did the World Wide Web. GTP showed up on top of TCP IP. So that freedom and flexibility of the architecture was enormously uh, enabling. And I think that's an important point to uh, hang on to. Of course, it also enabled a whole bunch of bad stuff to happen, which we still struggle with today. I, I love that you you brought that because you know I think that gets to the core of a lot of the challenges that we are grappling with today as technologists and as innovators, right? Which is how do you continue to design and innovate systems that are open and flexible and give people the ability to innovate without restrictions, while at the same time making sure that there is some thought given to the responsibility and accountability. So maybe you know this would be a good place for me to, to get both of your thoughts on. You know, with the internet and broadly speaking, technology getting so deeply interwoven into every fabric of our lives and society, what do you see as the responsibility and accountability mechanisms for innovators? Did you, for example, you know, when you were designing and watching the evolution of the internet, imagine that someday we may need a safe mode for the internet, right? You know, when, you know, when should we start to think about this? Uh, what is the right time and who are the right set of people to be carrying this responsibility? Well, keep in mind that we were originally doing this for the Defense Department, and I can tell you security is an issue in the Defense Department. So we were thinking about that early on. The timing was such that the technology that we use today wasn't quite available then. The, the, the public key crypto didn't show up in, in even conceptual form until 1976, not counting some work that went, happened earlier at GCHQ, which they didn't tell anybody about, but Marty Hellman and uh, Whit Diffie published a paper on new directions in cryptography in 76, which led to public key crypto, led to RSA and a bunch of other things, mm -hmm. which could be retrofitted into the architecture, but which wasn't available when we were more or less freezing uh, the, the design to get it implemented so we could see if it would work. But we retrofitted a lot of that stuff and we still have a lot of work to do to make it more secure uh, and more resistant uh, to various and sundry kinds of attack, even in the core of the net. Well, I guess I would argue that most of the bad stuff that we hear about, all the various you know, attacks and things, occur mostly at the edges of the net against the computers that are on the net as opposed to against the underlying network itself, although it too has its own set of potential vulnerabilities that we have to deal with. I mean, one, one of the things that I was always aware of was what could go wrong, but in the early phases, we we're just trying to get something out there I mean, if something was going to go wrong, there had to be something that it could go wrong against. So we were just trying to build something, get people to use it, see how it worked, try it out. Uh, over the course of my career, I've had all kinds of suggestions made of things that I thought were problematic. I'll give you an example. One, hopefully we'll get into this later. But um, Vint and I started an effort back in the late 80s when he was also at CNRI. Uh, on mobile programs, and that led to all of the stuff that you mentioned in your, your list of topics on digital object architecture. It was really, the, that was the genesis of, of a lot of those ideas. Um, and as part of that, one of the uh, key ingredients was the ability to identify information. 
I mean, it's, it's one thing to say, well, it was on page three of this book, which was on that shelf in this library, but maybe you just want to say, here's the identifier for it and just go directly to it. <clears throat> well, one of my colleagues came to me one day and said they had a great idea so that you could just do this. You don't need any central anything to manage it. Just simply identify any document by the concatenation in order of the five least likely words. So if you <laughs> use, uh, I don't know, um, anomatopoeia, some word that you hardly ever came up, just string the five least likely words together and that should be a unique identifier. And I remember saying to him, you know, if I wanted to subvert it, I would just create, you know, a million documents and make sure those five words are in it. And how, how are you going to find yours? It'll be one needle in a haystack kind of problem. I've seen that over and over and over again. Um, you know, I, Vint had uh, suggested I talk with uh, Tim Berners-Lee back in, 19, it was in January 1994 when he was just getting started on his uh, World Wide Web stuff. It was not the preeminent way of managing information back then. And the web has a lot of difficulties right now, except it's so very useful that it's it's just, it's, a, it's out there everywhere. Um, and uh, what I w told them was, I, I'm really concerned about the fact that people could put you know information out there that isn't true. You wanna know who's sending it. We need a way of identifying people. Um, I mean, so I could clearly see that back then. And I think the main reason why um, you know, we didn't get further involved in it back then was through all of those concerns. Well, we now see them in spades and, and now even Tim Berners-Lee is trying to reinvent the web or something he called WWW3 or something. So we'll, we'll see, but that was a concern of mine right from the get-go on everything I ever did. Yeah, no, I, I definitely hear you. And I, again, like I, I hear the fact about there are different layers to what we call the internet today, all the way from like the, the network layer to the application layer. And at what point and where does the responsibility lie is, is still a question that we keep coming back to, right? Because I'm fully on board with making sure that we're creating these technologies and allowing innovation to, to happen and foster that. But um, as technologists, do we have a responsibility? And at what point do we start thinking about this and maybe even having some terms of you know, usage around this? Well, but you know, the, the internet's really a grand collaboration. Um, and, and there is nothing that guarantees that it's gonna work. If, if somebody wants to unplug their country from the internet, they can probably do it for everything but some of the radio waves that might come in from offshore or something like that. Um, it really is a grand collaboration. There, there is no one in charge of ensuring that you can get from point A to point B in the physical world. You know, you may drive your car to the airport, the roads may get clogged, you, know, you may not be able to find a parking space, uh, maybe you can't get a cab, uh, maybe the plane won't go. I mean, there, are, there is nobody in charge of ensuring that you can get from one place to another. And, you know, we're even seeing with all of the, you know, the atrocities going on that even, even organizations that are set up to provide oversight can't necessarily react to deal with things when they go wrong. So I'm not sure what it is you're looking for, but in, in this conversation, but every country has their own concerns. In the U.S., clearly they, they do, the various groups that might get involved. There's no one place that's necessarily in, in charge of everything. The leadership in, in various ways that filter down, but every country has the same thing. So, I mean, I, I think you're looking for something that maybe is hypothetical, but doesn't, can't really exist in reality, except in a grand collaborative way. This is a great example of uh, Bob, and, Bob and I don't always agree. And, uh, and, and this is one case where, although what he says is, is I think, factually accurate, what Raghavan is asking for here uh, is something uh, that says that there should be a, a sense of responsibility. If you're running a business, and uh, whether it's a nonprofit or a for-profit, and people are using whatever product or services it is, you know, what accountability should there be? That's right. Uh, what is it that you owe uh, either the customer or the general public? 
<clears throat> in the course of business? And I think that's a reasonable question to ask. Um, and in the case of the internet, what's interesting to me from the technical point of view is that because of the layered architecture, you have different players at different layers. Yes. And those players can make things happen in various and sundry ways, depending on what layer they're at. And in particular, of course, when you get up to the application layer and content, uh, that's the most fraught part of the, of the system in many respects, because content uh, and, and the view of content uh, it, and the functionality at the application layer uh, is looked at through the lenses of culture, uh, history, um, you know, national rules and laws and all kinds of other things. So what is it that we expect a CEO to be thinking? That's right. When they're figure out what product or service are they building, they should be thinking, first of all, is there a business model that works? Second, what is it that I'm bringing to the customer that makes the customer want more of this service so I can grow the business? And third, is there anything about it that I would feel um, I would not want to have happen? And uh, to be quite honest with you, there's a lot of things that happen on the internet that I wish didn't happen, but they are the consequence of human decisions. And uh, as, as hard as we might try to build technology to resist abuse of one kind or another, depending on what that abuse is at what layer, uh, it's not absolutely possible to prevent it. Bob's point is exactly right. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. So uh, at, at Google, for example, uh, we have platforms where people inject whatever videos they want to put up. And we have some rules about what videos we're willing to host on the platform. And we try very hard to take the ones off that we think don't belong there. Some of them sneak through anyway. And, and so we struggle with that. I think that you're, um, uh, if, to speak to Raghavan's point, I think that CEOs who want to have a successful company and also want to feel like they are doing so in a way that is uh, uh, not reprehensible, to put it in the backward uh, way, uh, they have to ask themselves, OK, so how could my product or service be abused? And what can I do to re you know, reduce the potential for that? But, but I, 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 love, I love that you, you, you brought this angle in, because this is something that we talk about a lot as well in terms of having the foresight to make intentional choices, to be thoughtful about all of your stakeholders, because there are going to be unintended consequences. And then how do you make sure that you've thought about them and at least have some you know, mechanisms in place? I think the, the example that you gave from Google is, is, a, is a really good one. Um, but I also want to be mindful here that it's not always just the role of the, the technologists um, to think through this. So I, I'd yeah. love to also hear your thoughts on like, you know, what role do other players in the ecosystem right. need to play here? You know, we have elected bodies, lawmakers, academia, um, community groups. How should we think about this? The short, the short answer here is that technology does not solve all problems. And there are times when you have to have rules that you tell people are going to be enforced and, and to give them incentive not to do some bad thing. Uh, I'm sure, Bob, that you must have encountered this many times in, in your own career, uh, running your own company. What things do you choose to work on? What things do you choose not to work on? Yeah, it, it, sure. I, I just want to also, you know, close on the former point. Uh, you started out by saying that uh, uh, he and I don't always agree on everything, but I listened to what he said, and I think what he said is factually correct in every way. So I'm trying to understand what it is that you think we didn't agree on there, because I agree with everything you said. And, and you said factually what I said was right. And I, I just think that, you know, if everybody did their part in trying to understand how best to apply, you know, their view of what would go well or, or listen to, uh, you know, statements of principle that may come from on high, from different academies that may put out guidelines for how to behave, best practices and the like, it still doesn't guarantee that everything is going to work out well, because I mean, if, if that were the case, we'd have no crime in society, we'd have no accident, and nothing would go bad for any reason whatsoever. But we know that's the way things are, especially when they're not overly controlled from the top. If, if there was somebody who could overly control everything from the top, even then, I don't think you could prevent bad things from happening from time to time. So. 
I'm not sure what Minton I disagree on here, but um, I, well, I just this, agree what he said. <laughs> well, the reason that I reacted that way is that it sounded like uh, you, we one could conclude from what you said that, well, don't bother to do anything because you can't fix everything. And I think the right answer to this is if you can't fix everything, fix something. And and that's where I end up. And I think I agree you with that. I, that. That's my point of view. Exactly. I mean, you should do the best you can. Um, various parts of government are going to weigh in. Various parts of industry are going to weigh in. The academic community has an intellectual role to play here or maybe even a moral persuasion role of some sort. Um, I think we're in total agreement on that. All right. Well, that's awesome. So maybe, I'll, I, you know, I'll, I'll wrap this page up with the, uh, with a question that, you know, I think is on a lot of people's minds also. If you look at, if both of you look at the evolution of the internet over the past 50 years, what would you say has been your single most favorite application? And maybe we can just look at, you know, the last five years if you want to. And what are some ideas that the two of you had envisioned, you know, back when you were designing this that were so obvious to you, but you're still not pursuing? Well, I mean, for me, for me, I mean, it's, it's probably clear that email is the application I use the most. Uh, I don't know if it's my favorite, but, um, and, you know, the web has been particularly helpful because I use it to access all kinds of public information of all kinds. Um, and the internet has enabled streaming. I don't know whether you call that an application, but it's certainly a use of the internet that's been very important uh, during the pandemic. Um, you know, have, having said that, I think the 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 thing that Vint and I started working on back in the '80s on mobile programs led us to focus on the digital object architecture. Us being CNRI, because Vint had gone off to MCI sometime in the mid 1990s, and so he was off on on other things at that point. And when we introduced the notion of mobile programs, it was at a time when people were just becoming more aware of the vulnerabilities of the net, uh, viruses and worms and Trojan horses and the like. Um, and so a lot of the companies that saw that work, we shared that with a lot of the big companies, they all said, why would we want to have somebody else's program show up on our machine and run? It could be a virus. Mm -hmm. And so we said, all right, let's take out the mobility part. I mean, you ever you know, see those ice cream trucks that you used to come by your neighborhood as a kid, you know, mobile, mobile ice cream. Well, it didn't mean you couldn't buy ice cream in a fixed store on the corner. And so what we did was we said, okay, let's take the mobility out of mobile programs. And that's what essentially became the digital object architecture. That's an idea I could see back then as a really good idea. Um, I presume Vint could too, although maybe mobility was more critical to him than it necessarily has turned out to be. Um, but as a reality, uh, given that, it's still not as widespread as I'd like. Um, one of the things that came out of it was really important was the ability to identify information. Mm -hmm. um, that was probably the thing that was first out of the box because the publishing industry needed a way to identify their material and they uh, agreed to that. And so that's, that's widely used. I mean, if you look at all the IETF documents, they now have VOIs on them. If you look at what comes out of some of the government agencies, they have the same thing. And that's something we, you know, we, we still play a key role in. Publishers got organized around that. Another area that we we're very concerned in was persistence of the information. So it's one thing to be able to identify it, but it's another to be able to actually get it from the identifier. Somebody's got to maintain it and it's got to be in a form that can be understood and it's going to, if it's a hundred years from now, you know, like the National Archives might like, then you want to be sure that it's independent of the technology. This architecture has all the principles that the original internet had, open architecture, independence of the technology. I mean, it, it really is pretty powerful, but there's no, there's no forcing function that's as compelling as there was with the internet, which everybody wanted to be on this common communication platform. Um, people tend to want to manage their own information except when they want to access somebody else's. So on the web, you can't get to companies' internal information because they're not going to make it available, but they're going to have certain things they want the public to know and they're going to make that available. Well, 
This is an architecture that lets you identify everything, including the very private stuff. And so security is critical. And I think the most important part of this whole architecture is the ability of digital objects, which are the key, just like packets were key to some of the early networks, is that these digital objects need to be able to interact with other digital objects. And the digital object can be a fairly large thing, like an airplane in some ways is a big information system. Think of that as a digital object that has lots of other things in it, a repository, the digital object that has lots of other digital objects inside of it. And they can all have their own identifiers, cars. And so, you know, you know cars are clearly talking to cars for autonomous vehicles and planes are talking to planes, but maybe planes need to talk to cars just so they can land safely on a roadway in case of problems. In principle, every digital object ought to have the ability in principle to talk to any other digital object suitably, you know, acceptably from both ends. And uh, that, that's really part of what I saw as this original thing. I think Ben saw most of that, if not all of that, I want to speak for him, but it's not quite here yet because this is an incremental thing. We made incredible progress. There are billions of these identifiers resolved every day on the internet today, but people still haven't bought into, there's no global, global system here. I think it's gonna be a grand cooperation if we ever get there. Bob, I'm, we're gonna come back to this. I wanna give Vint a chance also to, to answer his, his favorites. Well, actually, uh, first of all, I'm a very heavy user of email too. There's too much of it, I mean, uh, uh, to be quite frank. And thank God for the filtering that uh, the Gmail does because there's a lot of stuff I don't care to look at. Um, and so I'm a heavy user of that. Uh, I'm also a super heavy user of search and I found myself unable to write anymore without being online because I get about halfway through a sentence and I gotta go look something up to figure out what the facts are. So I'm a heavy user of our own uh, search products as well. Uh, actually, I wanted to come back to something that, uh, that Bob mentioned about mobility. Um, there is a kind of mobility that is happening, and it is in the World Wide Web. Is when you think about how the web works, the first thing that happens is when your browser goes anywhere, it pulls a file in. So it's sucking in something that's going to interpret. And it used to be just interpreting HTML for formatting purposes, images and text and so on. Now, of course, it's executable stuff with HTML5. So the browser is actually an operating system that ingests a piece of code and then executes it. And so in a sense, uh, the World Wide Web has implemented a kind of knowledge robot. Uh, I think, and probably Bob thinks we can elaborate on that a lot, well beyond the current HTML5 world. But, uh, but there, that is a form of mobility which has shown up and it's been very powerful. Uh, okay. In terms, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, keep keep so, going. Uh, sorry. Keep going. Well, I, you, know, you were asking about what other stuff you know, am I, do I care about? Bob knows this very well, that uh, I've spent the last 20 years working on an interplanetary extension of the internet. And uh, to be quite honest, it's gone extremely well. We have prototype stuff running on Mars and in orbit around Mars. It's on the International Space Station and we'll be on our way uh, to the moon in the Artemis missions. So the team has put this stuff together in NASA and JAXA and ESA and the other space agencies. Uh, have managed to standardize all this stuff. So it's pretty exciting to imagine that this internet idea isn't confined to a terrestrial environment. I'm gonna come back to both of your ideas in a second, but we're gonna take a short detour and try something fun. Uh, I try to do this with a lot of my, uh, my conversations and you know, I call this the lightning round. These are meant to be you know, this or that type of questions. Um, and I'm just really looking for like a really quick response from you know, either one of you, both of you, if, you know, if, if it suits you. So let's let's get started. Let's start with the easy one: TCP or UDP? UDP. All right. Uh, both together. <laughs> <laughs> Great answer. Princeton or UCLA? Oh, uh, UCLA here, and you know, Princeton, Bob's here. Princeton here. <laughs> I know, that's why I wanted to ask this question. Um, all right, Edison or Tesla? Mm. Tesla. Mm. Uh, well, I'll go with Edison then. All right, DARPA or Bell Labs? They're very different, DARPA. 
Hey, we we got the same answer from both of you. That's awesome. Um, all right, switching uh, switching gears a little bit. Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Trek. I'm sorry, I, I didn't get your answer, Bob. Star Wars. Really? I mean, you said Star Trek. I said Star Trek because I'm closer to the people who did that. All right. Libraries or museums? Mm. Libraries. Libraries. Okay. Libraries here as well, for what it's worth. Alexa or Siri? Neither one. Google yeah. Assistant. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say another one. Neither one either. <laughs> but I don't have an alternative. Fair enough. Longevity research or brain computer interface? Brain computer interface. By longevity in research, you mean how to live longer? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I'll go with longevity. <laughs> At our advanced ages, that's probably a reasonable answer. Yeah. Um, on the presumption that that doesn't work, the brain computer interface strikes me as being uh, more likely. You kind of need a combination of both of them to. Well, to it, the, the problem is longevity, you know, is something you can have for a longer time, whereas the brain interface goes away. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Last What's two. The famous story that Woody Allen used to tell, you know, when he wanted he wanted to know uh, why uh, he and his wife got divorced. He said, "Well, divorce is something that lasts forever." <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, last two. Save Earth or terraform Mars. Save oh, Earth. Save Earth. Yeah. All right, and then the last one. Economic impact or societal impact? Or what? I didn't hear. Or, or societal impact. Economic impact or societal impact? The same thing in some ways. Yeah, well, I'll take societal impact on the grounds that Bob raised, which is economics is uh, in, you know, interwoven with that. Awesome. Um, let's, let's, you know, we're coming up on the sort of the last 10 minutes. And so I want to, you know, use this time to look towards the future and touch upon some of the topics that the both of you, know, both of you have brought up, which is really around the technology trends of the future that you're really excited about. Um, so when you talked about interplanetary networking and, and Bob, you talked about digital objects. As you start to think about this, I'd love to hear more of your personal stories for why are you investing your personal time and energy on these areas? across all of these different areas. You know, there's AI, there's, you know, interplanetary travel, there's brain computer interface. Why did you pick these two? Why are these so important to you? And how are you thinking about designing these with sort of like this notion of responsible innovation in mind? Well, it, speaking for myself, uh, I believe that we are gonna go off planet. Uh, we're already, you know, looking at, at the questions of commercialization uh, in space. And so, uh, Communications is going to be needed uh, in order to support that. It's an enabling capability. And as I look uh, into what it, what's going to happen, well, now we have questions like, what does it mean? To, what does private ownership mean? Are you allowed to own a mine on the moon? <clears throat> Can you own an asteroid? Um, and what about disputes? How will those be resolved? And we've been looking, the team has been looking at the interplanetary internet, wondering how that's going to work. How will we operate it? Multiple parties will be involved just like they are in the internet. How do we replicate that capability? What's the framework, uh, jurisdictional framework in which all that evolves? So it's absolutely fascinating. And it's been, it pulled me from focus on just the uh, interplanetary networking aspect to this much broader question of what are the rules of engagement uh, in space? How do we make that an environment that is uh, manageable? Fascinating. Bob, do you want to share your thoughts also? Well, I <laughs> I mean, Vin always goes off on interesting uh, venues of his own. So we'll, we'll see how that plays out. I think that's a really long-term venture. I, I mean, I'm not... I'm not as sanguine that we'll have any... I mean, we've had people on the moon and maybe we'll have people on Mars, but... You know, I don't think you'll see, you know, cities of a few hundred million people anytime soon. So, uh, or the infrastructure to support it, but it's, it's worth, worth uh, looking into that. I, I, I'm looking more at what's going on here in terms of um, the society as a whole. And 
you know, for all the uh, interest in the internet, the only reason that it's interesting is because people use it for informational purposes. They want to talk to each other. So communications is part of it, but communications is to communicate information. Get the computers either because they want information on the computers or the computers need information to do their job or variety of things. So, but today I believe we're in, we're still in the wild west, if I can use that analogy, you know, in terms of information, all kinds of rules, there's no standardization. There's no way that if you, like today with the internet, you can at least get bits from one place to another in a fairly standard form. What you do with them at the other end, we're still pretty much in the world of the fingers on keyboards and eyeballs on screens, which was the original idea that we were pursuing back when, because that's what made it possible to make the, the nets happen and the internet happen. We weren't trying to invent every application possible for all time. And so I think we need to get our ability to manage information on a more standard basis. Whether that turns it into a, um, a business opportunity for anybody in the near term or not, I don't know. I mean, computer networks were not really a business for anybody other than selling the lines, you know, up front. But I think in time, we're going to get there. I mean, we're seeing little bits of it. All the cloud services are there to try and deal with storage of information, but it's not done in a standardized way yet. They're working on that. Mm -hmm. um, if if you were to you know find a reference, let's say 150 years from now, you wouldn't want it to say the piece of information I'm referring to here was on a computer called such and such on the ARPANET back in 1967, which used to be housed in this building on the campus of UCLA, which maybe has been moved to someplace elsewhere, and uh, or it was in the book on line such and such. I mean, you want to be able to just instantly go from it to that, no matter what technology is supporting it, no matter where it's located. Um, we have some of those capabilities today. Like, you know, if you are on the ARPANET today and the computer is moved from one place to another, the DNS will automatically, you know, get you to where that computer is through resolution, but not necessarily at the informational level. So I think we, we need to get there and it's going to be gradual. So I'm just doing my part and what I can do because I think it's important. And maybe we'll set a good example. Maybe we don't. But ultimately, it's going to take industry getting behind it in a way that they can understand where the business is before it's really going to take off. Got it. Um, thank you so much for, for kind of sharing your personal interests. My, my last question as part of this conversation really is, you know, trying to bring this back full circle. It's almost 2023, right? So, so um 50 years since this started. Imagine, you know, you're a couple of founders who are just getting started and want to embark on, you know, your next 50 years. Uh, given everything we've talked about so far, you know, the choices that you make, the responsibility that you hold, the kinds of amazing new opportunities in front of us, what would be your words of wisdom to, you know, a couple of founders about to embark on this, you know, journey for the first time? Get help from people who are smarter than you are. Very wise words. Um, what, I, what I would say is that we ought to outline areas where more knowledge would be really helpful and focus on them. So, you know, Vint mentioned the brain computer interface. I mean, I think, you know, if we could start all over again, you know, I would spend more time trying to understand how the brain works and what the heck is going on in, in those neural wetware. Um, we, we know so little about it. I mean, look at how medicine has, has, has expanded over the past, you know, 100 years. I mean, it's just pretty amazing. I mean, watching, you know, film about, you know, some of this historical folks and, you know, they got really ill back then. That was it. I mean, because it was, they didn't know what to do. You know, you operated on them, you know, antibiotics. They didn't have the ability to... Um, you know, deal with the normal things that we deal with today. Who knows what pills will be, you know, possible. And my, one of my favorite films is a movie called The Day the Earth Stood Still, and they have some allusion to, you know, medical treatments that bring you back from the dead and then resurrect things and, you know, deal with uh, all kinds of things 
that we have no clue on today. Well, it's all science fiction, uh, but maybe one day it won't. And so that would be my my hope that we could we could do that's, something that's, like that. That's what engineering is. Engineering is turning science fiction into reality. That is such an awesome, awesome line to, to end this conversation on. Um, Vint and Bob, I, I really want to thank both of you for taking the time and walking us through, you know, both the history and how all this started. You're sharing your thoughts on, you know, what are the responsibilities as we start to design the next generation of applications and architectures and their own personal interests. It's been an amazing, amazing privilege to, to have this conversation with you. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thanks so much, Raghavan. Thank you. My pleasure.